My name is Jinky Innes Charles. And my name is Jamila Bolton Gordon. And we are the next generation of the Mangrove Nine. Um, and today we have some real special guests on our show. Um, such a privilege to have them on the show. Um, but we're going to start off um, by allowing them to introduce themselves. Uh, who better to do that than themselves? Jamila, do you want to introduce the first person or Jeff? Um, well, I'll start with myself initially. Again, I'm Jamila Bolton Gordon. Um, I'm Roden Gordon's daughter, um, who was part of the nine mangrove nine descendants. Well, I'm a descendant of the mangrove nine defendants. Um, and, and we're going to be speaking about the education on this particular topic. Um, and each one of our panelists and anybody else contributing will have a brief description um, of who they are, where they come from, and how their education, what education they did have. Uh, with myself in particular, um, I had a, I was born here in England, in Britain. Um, my education was the 11, first 11 years was quite interesting, which I'll go into later on. Um, it's quite mixed and quite diverse. Uh, it wasn't always positive. Um, and I'm currently just finishing a degree, which is oil and gas management and procurement. Yinka? Okay, hi. My name is Yinka Innes Charles. I'm also one of the Mangrove Nine descendants. Um, I, education wise, um, I would say I had kind of a bit of a mixed experience of education through the dirt for a few of my years. Um, sometimes I felt um, it was quite a hard uh, system to, to fight against to get to where you had to. I will go into that a bit later also. Um, I kind of went through my years and eventually as after having children, because it took me that long to decide that I would actually give it a go, I'd done a law degree. So I'd done my BA law, honours of law degree. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to allow other people to speak, but that's kind of briefly about me. I've done quite a few things in my career, from music to, uh, as I said, law. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Jeff. Um, Jeff Schumann, uh, was delighted to be, uh, I'm going to show my age now, that one of my, one, one, of, one of the young women in the institution where I was a teacher, her name is Jamila, um, when I was a young teacher, uh, Jamila was there as a student. Um, I wasn't educated for at least 18 years of my life, I went to a good university in London. Two members of this panel, one, I'm a devout, what's called a Johnite, I came across Augustine John and a paper that he wrote, a magnificent paper called In the Service of Black People. In fact, it's what pursued me to go into social education. And, um, uh, Gus was prominent, so I followed Gus and his career for, all the way from all these consultancies to his director of education in Hackney as a black man who showed me that you can still be very conscious and you can still get within the system. And the other individual was Cecil Gutsmore. When I was a student at university, yeah. Cecil came and gave a lecture. I'd never seen a Rastafarian or a man who looked so good and spoke so eloquently. And I had many years as a student going to a place called the Grassroots Bookstore in Goldbourne Road as a young man and would listen to people like Cecil, follow people like Gus. Um, after I became a qualified teacher, uh, I wanted to get involved in politics and I've done so ever since. I write a lot of political comedy right now and we've just pitched something to one of the television commissioners and hopefully we, you will see some what I would call black politically charged comedy on terrestrial television in the not too distant future. But that, that, that's my story. Thank you. Not too long. Okay, so now moving on, I think we can go on to uh, Professor John, us. Would you like to yeah. ask John, sir? In the Hello, house. Hello, friends. Um, so um, I was born in Grenada and thankfully received my primary and secondary education um, in Grenada. My final two years of schooling, A-levels, um, was in Trinidad before I came here in August of 1964. Um, in the years that followed, I lived in Notting Hill, um, St. Quentin Gardens, just up the way from the Grove. Um, I shared a house with Seven Baptiste, the oh, carnivalist, yeah. and um, spent a long, a lot of time, uh, actually, with with, with um, um, Jamila's dad, Gordon uh, Roden, 
at the um, BPIC, Black People's Information Center. Uh, and that was because I got a lot of support from him. I, I spent some time working as a youth worker at the Metro Youth Club. And then at a rather quaint place near Paddington called um, the Cryptic One Club in the crypt of St. Michael's Church. Um, um, my education journey really started when I was studying theology in the city of Oxford, um, working with the children of um, car workers at the Morris Oxford car plant, uh, whose mothers typically um, worked at the two hospitals, the Churchill and the Radcliffe. Uh, and then I did a, a diploma in youth and community work and um, went to Birmingham to do the stuff for the Renemy Trust and then other things followed. Um, sociology at the University of Manchester and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, I suppose my contribution to this conversation really is um, as a, a, an education activist that started in Oxford and continued throughout the late 60s, 70s, 80s to the present. Um, uh, and and one of the things that that was what I want um, um, motivated me really was the fact that uh, coming from a small village and from a very very poor family, I was only only able to get a, a decent uh, secondary education because I, I won a scholarship. And I was conscious as I as I as I went through secondary school and indeed in my adult life that many of the young people who went to my primary school were a hell of a lot brighter than I was. Uh, and many of them couldn't progress to secondary school or to any other kind of continuing education. Uh, many died young, prematurely from, from rum, um, from unemployment and a loss of hope and uh, it seemed to me that the colonial education system was was um, 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 uh, framed very much around elitism, uh, as indeed it still is now. And too many people lost the opportunity to be their best selves because of poverty and because the 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 the, the right to schooling was too dependent upon um, uh, money. And 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 what have you? So that's been my 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 motivation really throughout 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 my life. The rights, the education rights of every child, and Definitely. ensuring that schooling systems deliver children's educational entitlement. Thank you, Gus, for that introduction. Um, Cecil Cecil Gutsmore. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, it is really good to be with you. Uh, like uh, Professor Gus, I was born in the Caribbean in Jamaica and actually came here when I was approaching 17. Um, I had aspirations then to be a Baptist minister. Uh -huh. And so I was interested in, in continuing my education, but that happened via factory work um, and via office work and then via part-time and then full-time education. Uh, a lot of the early stuff was in Kilburn Polytechnic and I may return to that. Um, after university and my university time was at Leicester and at the School of Oriental and African Studies, I've actually done research in some other um, universities, but that's re really neither here nor there. Um, my occupational life, my work included community work, um, including a good decade, and I really do mean good decade in, in Ladbroke Grove working with Jamila's father and some other extraordinary people, um, 
I learned much more there than I learned in, in any, any university. And um, importantly, what I learned at university, not in the formal sense, but using the, the space and time it afforded me to, to teach myself some Caribbean um, history and some African history, I, I tried to pass on in the community. And, and one of the important things that I think we maybe should talk about today is actually the, 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 the contribution that education conducted within the community has made to the development of, 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 of many people. So um, I can- Thank you. And following through, can we um, have um, Leo? Leo, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Um, greetings, brothers and sisters. Uh, my name is uh, Brother Leo Mohammed. Uh, I'm greatly honored and privileged to have this opportunity to be with all of you and to be with the other uh, guests on this panel discussion. Um, my own reality is that uh, I was born on the island of Jamaica, came to this country in 1967, had uh, very, very little formal education, approximately three years in my entire life have I been formally educated. Uh, I did do a, a brief college course learning drama um, at a very late stage in my life. but. Um, Essentially, I am a member of the Nation of Islam, London Study Group. Um, that's really where the bulk of my education has come from in terms of uh, history, culture, uh, theology, religion, etc. All of what I would claim to know today, uh, I really received through the teachings of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. Uh, that's the platform and the foundation on which I stand. But um, essentially, essentially, that's that's who I am. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, beloved. Um, Ishmael. Okay, I'm Ishmael Blagrove. Um, echoing what um, Jeff Schumann said, um, I also have a history in terms of grassroots. Cecil and Cecil Gutsmore and um, Gus John. They were titans. For me growing up you know you'd always hear their names uh, their names were ringing back in the day as was sort of um john larose jessica huntley and the key road and your father and key characters and stuff like that um and you know that's in, in in one sense sort of motivated me to kind of get involved in the struggles um and i've been documenting sort of oral history of the of black resistance black radical resistance in particular for over the last uh, part over, over 30 years now and that's where i stand at the moment Apologies for that. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, currently um, uh, in the final stages of um, making a film for the BBC about the British Black Power in the sixties and seventies, and that's um, how I've had the pleasure to meet Jimmy and um, Cecil, uh, who contributed. Ishmael, I know from before, he's also contributed to the documentary, and you know, it's. Um, it's a history that I'll be honest with you, I didn't know very much about until I started making this film earlier this year. And uh, now I know a, 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 an awful lot uh, about it. And, um, you know, I'm j I just hope this documentary, when it does air on the BBC, which I think will probably be the beginning of next year, will provide that sort of um, educational, really necessary educational component for people in this country, black people in this country, I'll start with. And then, you know, people in this country as a whole, because it's such an, an important part of our history and everyone else's history uh, in this country. My own education, I, I went to a very good school. I was very fortunate in spite of not come, well, not having any parents around, but I went to a boarding school. I got a good education. I definitely experienced racism in various forms when I was at school, uh, but I didn't want to go to Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, I wanted to go to art college and then it was in, uh, when I went to art college I went to North East London Polytechnic as it was called then, it's now called University of East London. Um, I began with um, I guess photography and then from there I got into to film and video 
uh, and that's all I wanted to do. I did a degree course uh, for three years, and then after the degree course, I found out there was a very cheap part-time in, um, independent study course, which basically I did. I, well, you could make up your own course, and mine, of course, was filmmaking. And it, it just became an excuse for me to still use the filmmaking facilities at the, at the University of East London for another two years and carry on making films. And then from there, I went to, I, I, I um, applied to get into the National Film and Television School. Uh, by this time, I was in my late 20s. And I went to the National Film and TV School and studied documentary directing. And um, so from there, <clears throat> you know, I've, I've come out of there and, and basically sort of tried to, to have a career as a, as a filmmaker. Thank you very much, George. Uh, next up will be Frank. Frank, you with us? Hey. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you, Frank. Hi, hi everyone. Hi. Uh, I'm Frank, Frank Prosper. I must say I'm honored to be amongst some people that I've followed all my life in education and in comedy. I think I'm the, the, the rogue in the pack here. <laughs> in, the <sense> that, <laughs> in the sense that I'm, I'm 59. I grew up in West London. Um, music brought me to Labour Grove. Um, some of you mentioned going to um, Jamila's father's shop um, place, Black People's Information in the early days. I don't even remember that there should be a record store outside that place on a Saturday. I was the kid on that stall selling the records. <laughs> and um, and so it was always great to hear the, the conversation in the background. There was plenty. <laughs> there was plenty of conversation in the background. Um, I'm a child of the 70s. So I, I can explain. I was very, I got quickly disillusioned with society after a racist incident and, and getting arrested for sus when I was 15. And so um, I sort of dropped out and became a frequent visit, visitor of places like All Saints Road and everything like that. I did not get an um, education at a comprehensive school, but I did get an education in prison where I got all my qualifications. And it was a chance meeting in prison with a theatre director that changed my life. And I came out and started working in theatre um, I engaged young kids who were like myself. I engaged them through theatre, kids at risk. And um, recently I've started writing um, a lot of theatre scripts. So um, that's in a nutshell who I am. Thank you, Frank. Thank you for sharing that. Um, next up, we have uh, Courtier Newlands. Um, would you like to tell us about yourself? Of course. Yes, yes. Uh, evening, everybody. Uh, Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. In this company, man, it's really fulfilling already. Um, uh, start off with me, uh, what do I do? Uh, I'm a writer, basically. I write novels, plays, uh, screenplays, uh, short stories. Uh, I've been writing for about 20 years or so. Uh, brought up in West London, I'm a Londoner. Um, lived in that area my whole life, but uh, now I'm living in East London for my sins. Um, I must have some big sins. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get told that a lot. Um, I, my education uh, was it's, it's very it's interesting really because my education its story is is I don't know it's it, I think a lot of people have the same story but it, it's it's different from the norm from what you usually hear in that uh, I just feel like formal education just wasn't challenging for me. Uh, they couldn't do enough for me, uh, you know, and I'll go into that later by what, I'm, what I mean by that, but, but there wasn't enough stimulation mm -hmm. in, in formal education. So I got bored very quickly and I got disillusioned with it and I strayed from that. And uh, I left school with very little qualifications because of that, uh, despite being able to do, you know, being able to pass those exams, I just didn't find it stimulating at all. And I kind of educated myself through the reading of books. I had a love of reading, deep love of reading books. And I educated myself that way and only returned to formal education five, six years ago, something like that. I decided I was going to do a PhD and I haven't finished it yet. 
But um, I mean, I'm in the final furlong of, of, of doing a, doing a PhD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I skipped all of the, even GCSEs, you know, I had about three GCSEs and stuff to go, and then, and then came back years later to do that. So uh, that's me, really. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Um, and next we have Jennifer Lewis. You there, Jennifer? Mr. Jennifer, are you with us? I saw her skip off for a minute. So maybe she thought that she'd have enough time to skip off and come we back. we move to the next spokesperson okay. then? So I move on to Mila Kenny. Wait, just a second. Go out of here for a minute. I'm coming in a minute. Go and play. <laughs> Sister Camilla. Sorry, children, sorry. <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm trying to keep my one at bay at my side. Say, you, and Jamila, you and Jamila should have shared a household for the afternoon. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> anyway, just to say, I really um, feel honoured to be amongst such um, people. Um, so basically me, I, I grew up in Labrook Grove. I was born in the early 70s. I would say a huge part of my education, which I would obviously describe as not formal education, was growing up in Labrook Grove. I think that's a huge part of how I identify myself. Um, didn't do that good at secondary school, went to, started, um, have, I have children, started going to, around Mangrove and Tabernacle, got involved in mask making, which um, I'm an early years educator, I'm currently a nursery manager. Um, in terms of early years education, what really the person a person that really influenced me was a lady called Louise Dermot Sparks. She's an American activist who wrote a book called The Anti Bias Curriculum. Um, going I, I, another person, another book that hugely influenced me was the work of Frances Cress Wilson and her ISIS paper. Um, in terms of her work and also Louise Dermot Sparks, it's made me passionate about um, addressing the inequalities within the education system. For me, it's, as I'm an early years educator, I feel the impact that I can make is with early years, and that's basically who I am. Thank you for that, Camilla. Um, Jennifer, you're back. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi everyone, my name is Jennifer Lewis, um, Jen. I Hi, Jen. Um, disappeared because it seems very dark in where I am compared to everyone else as well. So I was trying to put a lamp on, um, light up the situation a little bit. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> I, I don't know what, what's wrong with East London, Portia. I, I, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm an East Ender by birth. Um, <laughs> born in deep as, as dark as Bethnal Green. Uh -huh. And I now reside in Havering, or better known as Romford. Um, Sorry, Jen, Jen, can you just speak up a little bit or your mic? Yeah, it might be, it might be the mic. Is that better? Yes, okay. thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, I now reside in Havering in Romford. Um, I had uh, a quite an unremarkable um, school, school career. Uh, primary and secondary school, biggest influences on me were my were my English teachers at both primary and secondary school, um, who, uh, along with my father, gave me a massive love of reading, which I think has been my saviour. Um, I didn't go to university because I would have been the first person in my family to go to university. And uh, unfortunately, my mother passed away when I was 19. I, although my I had, uh, I had gotten into two then polytechnics, Middlesex and Hatfield. Um, but because my mum had passed away, I just thought, well, I'm not going to do that now. And it was only more recently, at the grand old age, I'm 56, but in the grand old, more, much more recently in the last six years, that I realised that I could have gone. It didn't occur to me that I, uh, that I could have at the time. And there was nobody um, in my life, active in my life, who told me that I could. So I didn't, and I pursued uh, work. I'd started, I, I, I had a job, I, I got into the fashion industry and was involved in that for a very long time. Um, 
I became a designer, had my own label, uh, did my very early actually. I, I started I started my own business quite early, and uh, enjoyed that as a career for a long time. And then uh, got into fitness through a back injury, and became a fitness instructor and a massage therapist, and uh, then latterly started working with young people young homeless people actually and started delivering social education to young people um, and then moved from that environment to working with young parents so young girls who principally young girls who'd been excluded from school by virtue of the fact that they'd become pregnant when they were sort of 15 16 and um, always when working with young people I always would think well, I wonder what their backstory is. I wonder if I'd met them, you know, a few years before, but maybe I could have not perhaps saved them, but if I could have intervened at an earlier stage in their life, that maybe they wouldn't be here. And then found myself working with young people at that earlier stage of life. Uh, when I went to work in behavior management at a school in West London. Um, and I stayed there for eight years. Um, and my main job, looking back, was really just preventing kids from, trying to prevent kids from being excluded from school and also working with their family. Um, and it was then that I just decided to go to university to, in fact, the Institute of Family Therapy and did a degree in family therapy and a postgraduate. Um, and I think just not, during this time as well, I was uh, volunteering with a group called the 100 Black Men of London and actually designed a couple of programs for them um, which is still running to today and, and that's how I met my friend uh, Gus John who uh, insists that I call him my friend and not my boss that he now is because I now work for three and a half years uh, well a few, a few years ago I joined the Communities Empowerment Network as a trustee uh, graduating to um, chair uh, uh, with Gus's encouragement um, and then I left and then returned three and a half years ago as the director of the uh, Communities Empowerment Network which is a an organization that works with parents to, to really to intervene on behalf of children who are at risk of exclusion uh, but also when they've been excluded so providing advocacy representation and assistance really and support to parents who when they approach us are usually at the end of their tether and you know kids have been excluded and it's the one thing you know nothing about exclusion until your child is excluded uh, so you're you're immediately on the back foot and so we provide free advocacy support for for those young people or for, for parents our, our clients are, are are the parents um, but those who, for whom, on, on whose behalf we work are the children. So we provide free advocacy support. Um, we, we train volunteers to deliver that advocacy. Um, and yeah, I've been there for three and a half years. We are entering a very new phase of, well, we have entered a new phase under lockdown, um, but we are still going strong. We, about a year ago, about a year and a half ago, we were on our uppers. We we thought that we might have to close, but we haven't. Um, and we're, we're, no. we're supported by funding, purely oh, by, no. by trust funding. Okay. Um, yeah, and that's that's it. That's me, I think. Thank you, Thank Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you. Uh, right. can, we, can we have um, uh, Brian? Thank you. Um, my name is Brian Knight. <laughs> and I am a journalist and oral historian. And for the past two years, I've been researching the Black Power Movement in the UK and looking at decolonization and how that had an effect uh, on Britain. So I've been looking at Mangrove Nine and um, I really conducted an oral history uh, project where I was talking to some of the descendants of the Mangrove Nine people that were campaigning during that time to try and get an understanding of what it was like and what motivated the Mangrove Nine to um, take up their campaign 
and also to look at the support that they had within the community. And uh, I was born in Kenya, but um, I grew up in the Southwest, so that's where I did, uh, where I was educated. Throughout my time in education, um, you know, there's been problems with the curriculum. Uh, so I've seen how uh, the curriculum doesn't really include black or minority voices. And uh, that's something that I've been speaking about and uh, trying to campaign. So trying to decolonize the curriculum and trying to change the way that, um, especially the university, um, it's kind of structured and the way that it's, it works, trying to encourage uh, more roundtable discussions between mm. people mm. who write the curriculum, people who teach the curriculum, and students who are actually taught about it. So that's kind of, that's my interest in all of this. Thank you very much, Brian. Can we have um, Trey? <laughs> yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Trey, I'm a uni student uh, currently. I'm studying digital film production and I'm currently doing film production on Black Lives and how on the curriculum it, um, it affects, you know, um, when it gets to a level where the curriculum is about Quentin Tarantino and other directors, but they never include a black director. They never talk about black directors. And as a student myself, I was, my background is Caribbean, so I come from Jamaica and my father's from Barbados. So I, as a student raised in South, like um, Brian said, the curriculum was messed up. And I was told from college, um, really and truly, you know, I, w I couldn't really make it in film. There's no way I can make it in film because um, one, I'm black and most people who aren't black were recognized for directing and writing scripts and everything. So I wanted to take that next little step in my education and I went to university just so I can prove people, no, there can be a black director in this world. You know, there can, I can show you what black people do go through, through film and then um, give you a better understanding of what we go through in a sense of where it don't have to be always violent. It can be shown a different way, you know? And that's, yeah, that's who I am, so yeah. Okay, do we, can we have now Jerry? Jerry Woolley, would you like to speak? Yes, yes, family, what's going on, man? Greetings. Hi, hi. Oh, man, I'm grateful to be here. Yes, Jerry. Yes, in the house. yes, my people. Even though I've been introduced as Jerry, I actually prefer it as Mutulu to get me for various okay. reasons. That's the, that's my alias that is more true to me, you know. And um, yeah, man, my education journey started in Sweden. That's where I was born. Spent ten years of my life there. My first ten years of my life there, completely ob ob oblivious to racism, even though I was an extreme minority there. And then it wasn't until I moved to England, and I spent my secondary education here. And now that was a, that was a great shift because I've gone from, you know, a rural country like Sweden and then I've come to urban, gritty London, you get what I'm saying? And now I'm surrounded by people that look like me, my age group and that. So now I'm having a lot more, I guess, a lot more insight to black culture, specifically in UK, do you get what I'm saying? And that was kind of like the, the first time I got an introduction to who I am, do you get it? Because living somewhere where, you know, you're not surrounded by people like you, you don't, you don't know any better, do you get what I'm saying? But yeah. then when you come in, you, you finally realize it. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, okay, this is how you look move. Yeah, da, 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 do you get what I'm saying? So that was, that was predominantly what secondary school done for me. It, it allowed me to realize my identity. In terms of the education side of secondary school, it was non-existent. Like, I don't feel like, yeah, you can't you can't make an elephant climb a tree. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, school is not gonna serve everyone. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, people's talents are elsewhere. Do you get what I'm saying? So. I think it was my brother, I think Kortiev, forgive me if I'm saying your name wrong, but you were saying how, you know, you weren't stimulated in school. And I just, I vibe with that, man. Like, school was not doing it for me. So when it come to getting my results in GCSEs, it was just like, yeah, out the window, really and truly. But I still managed to go to college, do you get what I'm saying? And um, I, that's, I, I done something that wasn't true to me again, but I was just trying to go to college to make my mom proud, do you get what I'm saying? Make her smile and whatnot. But then it wasn't until I finished college, that I finally actually breathed life to what I felt my my 
innate talents was, which was acting, being a performer, being a creative. And then that's when I finally segued to go acting school instead of university. And then simultaneously finding myself within the acting world, I found myself awakening my Africanity as well, because I wasn't necessarily, although I'm doing acting, I wasn't necessarily receiving um, educational nourishment. Do you get what I'm saying? So I started to find that in black history, who I am, do you get what I'm saying? That was, that was sufficing as my, you know, my education, my educational satisfaction. Do you get what I'm saying? And it started yeah. with Hidden Colors by Tariq Nasheed. After I watched a few of those documentaries, I was like, yeah, this, this, this is what I need to know, you know? Because we're not being taught this in school. We're not being taught this in secondary school. Our generation right now, we, if we're not, if you don't show us the lake, we don't know any better. You get what I'm saying? Like, I feel like we definitely have the will to want to drink the water, but if we don't even know how to get to the lake, then do you get me? We're just gonna stay oblivious. Do you get what I'm saying? And I felt, I definitely feel like ours are a product of that. Do you get? It? So, but luckily, it was by, you know, the higher power which led me to, you know, the the introduction to, you know, wanting to delve deep into learning about myself, which then sparked the new aspiration of wanting to be an activist within my community. Do you get what I'm saying? So from there. I just started getting involved with a lot of things. I started just educating myself, researching, watching documentaries, meeting people, talking to scholars, et cetera, et cetera. Do you know what I'm saying? And really just trying to, you know, fully entrance and, 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 and revolve myself around a world that I know I belong in. Do you get what I'm saying? Because the system I've been set up to be in doesn't have the best of interest for me. So yeah, really and truly, that's that's where I am right now, you know. And and then I kind of intertwined both my desires with each other. So I want to be an actor. I also want to be a black activist. So with that going together, I now want to be an actor that does stuff for my people. Do you get what I'm saying? Like if it's not for my people, then I'll, I'm not interested. You get me? Because we already know, you know, the acting industry, Hollywood, to be specific, has a very strong agenda of propaganda. Do you get what I'm saying? So I feel like for young black males or young black females, if you're really trying to elevate your people, do you get what I'm saying? Be very cautious and conscious about the type of the, the industry the industry you're already in does not necessarily care for you even though we're getting a lot of things you need to really look deep and look at the substance of it do you get me it's not it's not for us so we kind of need to make our own little hollywood do you get what i'm saying we need to make our own stuff for our own people do you get what i'm saying and that's the type of actor that i want to really you know surf do you get me but yeah man let me not go on that's me. okay thank you for that I'm on Tulu. um so we're going to go into discussion. I think everybody's kind of introduced themselves now. Um, and before we kind of start uh, some of the questions that we want to address, um, I'd just like to ask a question to Gus um, based on the fact of that, uh, basically my uncle, I'm sure you uh, you know my uncle uh, Gus, uh, Melbourne Innis. Yes. Um, so he passed, unfortunately, away um, a few months, well, this year. Um, and the reason I'm mentioning him, so just rest in peace to my uncle anyway. Um, he, you, in 1990, he came over with his wife Trudy, uh, which is Hermia, which um, you also know. Um, so in 19, so they're both teachers. Uh, so they were, they've been teaching in the UK for over, I think, 16, over 16 years or nearly 20 years, um, living in East London. So more of the areas where the education was needed, um, where it was lacking. So in 1990, you brought over, they came along with about, is it 50 teachers that you brought over to the UK um, to help teach in, in areas like acne, um, of which they were teaching in. So I've just got a question for you based on, because my uncle, he always complained uh, about the system here as well when he came over in the way that uh, the teachers actually taught and educated their pupils before it was compared to how he was um, educated in, in Trinidad is where he came from um, and the way they taught in the schools and, and the qualifications that were needed for the teachers to actually teach. Um, he found it very shocking when he came to the UK um, and noticed how some of the, especially the younger teachers, uh, the qualifications they had which enabled them to actually teach in, in, in the UK. Um, he also set up like a Saturday school um, because he felt the need for educating them on their black history because he found obviously that it was definitely lacked in the UK um, and he thought that was very important for the younger generation to learn about their black history. But my question to you Gus is you know why did you you know why did you bring over 50 uh, teachers from from the Caribbean um, and you know what why did you feel it was needed? 
Well, Yinka, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, I started as a director of education in Hackney in the beginning of 19, middle of 1989. Uh, there was a massive primary teacher shortage across the country. Um, in one term, uh, some, some, some children were having uh, as many as 27 teachers um, teaching them for one term only. Um, Hackney was um, a, 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 a very interesting place. The education that children were getting there, children of any ethnicity, was not particularly brilliant. Um, in fact, when I became the director of education, I was asked to go to the Department for Education to get a briefing from the precursor of Ofsted, uh, HMI, Her Majesty's Inspectorate. And they sat me down for one full day, um, giving me a, 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 an audit, if you like, of each school in Hackney, at the end of which they identified 13 schools which were failing kids and uh, wanted me to come back in three weeks with a plan for turning all of those 13 schools around or else they would shut them. Um, many of them were primary schools. Uh, and I determined that um, the, the quality of the teaching was so poor um, the government wanted us to recruit teachers from Germany, Sweden, um, parts of the European Union. Uh, and I determined that uh, those children needed some teachers who knew what teaching was about to assist them to, 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 to realize the potential, basically. At the time, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank were squeezing the islands of the Caribbean, Trinidad, although it had oil and whatever, um, went to the IMF for a loan. And as part of what they call structural adjustment, they required the country to sack a whole heap of its public workers, including teachers. So overnight, there was a huge bank, a huge reserve of very qualified teachers in Trinidad, many of whom are going to the United States to work as nannies or to look after old people, et cetera, et cetera. And I determined that uh, the children of Hackney could do with their expertise and their passion for teaching and children's learning. So I managed to persuade Hackney Council to let me go to Trinidad and recruit from amongst those teachers who had been retrenched. Um, there was a wonderful Barbadian uh, school inspector, uh, Winston Best, who passed on some few years ago. Uh, and I made him the primary school inspector for Hackney. Uh, and I went with him to Trinidad and we interviewed about 175 people. And from amongst those chose 50 teachers to come to teach, to come to teach in Hackney. Um, we give them contracts. Uh, initially, we could only give them contracts for two years. They duly came. We made sure that they could all gain qualified teacher status. We deployed them in those schools. They found two things. You mentioned one of them. They found that their own children because they came as families. Um, I determined that uh, I was not going to bring teachers and leave the families behind. Not only because I didn't want to be responsible for anybody's divorce and family breakup, but because when the flow is in the other direction and they send people from Europe to our countries to do what they call technical aid, they come with everything, including the dog and the kitchen sink. Um, and therefore, I was not going to bring the teachers and leave the families back there. Everybody came. Yeah, my niece, my cousins came also. And one of the arguments I had in the full council meeting in, 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 in uh, uh, Hackney Borough Council was some stupid 
counselor getting up and wanting me to explain why I brought all of these people, 50 families, 50 teachers and the families on British West Indian Airways rather than on our airline, meaning British Airways. So I had to deal with him. <laughs> um, um, but those children came and what, what the, the, the parents were totally bewildered at the regression that there was in those children's learning within weeks of them getting yeah. here. Yeah, so that, that's considerably more advanced for their age than the classes that they joined. Yeah. So that was the first thing. The second thing was the teachers were totally bewildered at the quality of the teaching that those around them were actually doing. Mm. Um, and and uh, they helped to Im improve primary education. Five of them were secondary. They were, they were in the secondary schools. They helped to improve education massively, mm. not just in terms of the children that they were teaching, but the influence they had on black parents, in, in, in other words, uh, demonstrating to those parents that the children could do considerably better and they were not being stretched enough by their own teachers because the teachers expected so little of them. And just yeah, thank you, Gus. One anecdote. Um, I had to sack one of these uh, um, primary school head teachers in, 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 in Hackney because this woman goes into a class run by <laughs> teachers uh, to observe. So she observed this te teacher teaching for about half an hour and then intervened in the in the in front of the whole class and told this told the teacher i want you to stop we don't do these things here so the teacher was doing two things she was teaching writing teaching children how to write and she was also teaching phonics reading through phonics and she was totally humiliated by that woman. So I called the head teacher in in the afternoon and sacked her, which caused a big storm. The, the unions were up in arms. They demonstrated outside my house, outside the town hall, <laughs> everything. She remained sacked. Okay. And I sent a message to them all that they were not going to mess with any one of those 50 teachers. Put your racism in your pocket. Don't bring it to them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a kind of battle i had with that place throughout throughout my time there so in a word those children those teachers contributed massively to the improvement of education in hackney many of them in turn became head teachers and deputy heads and 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 so on so you know i i believe hey, that Gus, Gus, I, Gus, my Gus. entire education career it was to bring those 50 teachers from trinidad can I ask a wider question to all the panelists and the activists on here? Having listened to everybody, it is very clear that the majority of us are saying that we were somehow miseducated. The curriculum didn't do us justice. Yeah. Uh, Cecil, you've worked in, the, in, in the, the, the sphere of being a race advisor in Hammersmith and Fulham, uh, and a stalwart in, in African and Caribbean education. Ishmael, you are well known, as is Leo, Speaker's Corner for talking about the harsh realities of how bad the curriculum is. Can I ask generally to the panelists, what is the way forward in getting what we would call a balanced education onto the curriculum? So we know about the mangrove line. So we know about the journey of knowledge of self. What, 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 what would be, because they're not gonna change the curriculum overnight, but what are the manifestations? The books aren't being, you know, uh, Walter Rodney uh, Bookstore, the Huntleys have been mentioned. What, what's, going to, what's going to be the innovation to attack the curriculum to give a balanced education to everybody? Ishmael. Well, I mean, I, I, I think um, Leo Mohammed would be a better placed um, in terms of well, answering I, I'm that. I'm asking question. everybody. In terms, in, in, terms of, in terms of answering that question, particularly what I do in terms of my work is I, you know, <clears throat> we, we, we've been in publishing for about the last 30 years. We try and pop, we try and put out the type of material that I believe that we should have out there, as opposed to sort of relying or being dependent upon the um, national curriculum. Um, for example, when, when we were in making producing documentaries, and if you know any of the sort of documentaries that we produced independently as Rice and Peace films, then we were looking at subjects and saying, well, <clears throat> why 
isn't this a story being told or, um, or, or being related in some format, whether it be um, book or film? So we went out and t- sort of did stories like Roaring Lion, the rise of Rastafari, telling the history of the Rastafari movement, feeling that that, that, that was important, that that um, story was out there in the in the wider ether. So what uh, you know, so I can't necessarily say in terms of what necessarily needs to be done for the wider curriculum. I do know that as a result of um, what's been happening with the man, with the sort of um, George Floyd and all the protests um, la, um, this year with the Black Lives Matter movement, that there is sort of movement and traction in terms of sort of incorporating some sense of a, a, of the Black British experience within the sort of um, educational curriculum. How far that goes, what sort of material will be, will be covered in that, I haven't got a clue. But I know in terms of what we do at Rice and Bees, where I'm not dependent upon the national curriculum or not, we'll be even expecting anything from them. So what I'm dealing with is putting out the material that I believe we ought to see. And I think that's one thing that we ought to be doing a lot more in terms of writing a lot more. Our, our, our histories are not being recorded. If you look at the, when we, we I, I received a couple of calls recently and people asking about uh, where they can find books about the Mangrove Nine or where they can find, you know, so there's a, there's a, there's a big gap in the market. So we have, there's a lot of catch up that we have to do in terms of documenting our history and so many experiences, it's, in particularly when it comes to um, titans like Cecil Gutsmore and people like um, uh, Gu- um, Professor Gus John. Can I just say, that, 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 that leads in nicely to Brother Cecil, because Cecil has written, and I'll come back to Brother Leo, Brother Cecil, mm. you have written um, extensively and, and have also been an activist in trying to change the curriculum, both I know in the Caribbean and also uh, um, in, in this country. Ishmael makes a valid point, and the point is, is that you know he makes programs, documentaries. But if I'm a school teacher, as I was, it's not compulsory or mandatory for me to show any of Ishmael's work. If the curriculum says children in year two, three, four have to learn mathematics, they have to learn English, they have to learn a particular type of history, that that's not that's non-negotiable. We're talking about giving balanced education. What can we do? like the action Gus took as a director of education, what can be done in regards to the curriculum, the balance to ensure that our children do get to hear about the Mangrove Nine, who do get to hear about Marcus Garvey and not have to wait to go to university to learn about him. Any, any, any thoughts on that, Brother Cecil? Um, um, your um, mic, you need to unmute your mic, Cecil. It matters enormously the the racist nature of the place we are in. It matters enormously how uninterested those who run education in Britain, the British state, is in balanced, (laughs) non-colonial, non-racist education, and how much and how systematically they have resisted over over the years. So that um, the effort inside of the education system to bring about change um, has been systematically frustrated. Um, Some years ago, uh, the state declared its its interest in independent, you know, facilitating independent schools. Um, There was a, a rash almost of black originated proposals around setting up at least one black school. All of those, and I am sure they were well designed, but none of those proposals was accepted. Um, Now, when I was teaching, for example, in Hammersmith and Fulham, that briefly, this would have been in the 1970s, we, we instituted Black Studies courses. Round about that time, there's a brother here called Sam Morris who wrote a little book called Black Studies, The Case and the Courts. Um, Very little is allowed through and very little that is allowed through survives because it depends, um, since it's not coming from the center, because it depends on school initiatives, sometimes on the initiative of directors of education, sometimes on the initiative of principals. It's very difficult to achieve change in this place. So it matters the extent to which we have engaged in community education, the stuff that um, that that Ishmael just mentioned, uh, the, the, the Brother Gus John's books, um, our bookshops, 
our Saturday schools and so on. Um, I don't really have any clear idea about how we as a community, although we're actually not sufficiently organized, actually impact this state and this society around the issue of changing their curriculum um, to our advantage in a situation where the curriculum runs systematically to our disadvantage. But it's important that we recognize what we have done and what we are doing and the difficulties that we face in the situation that we find ourselves in. Britain yep. is a very <laughs> racist, resistant place. Yeah. Brother, Brother Leo, thank you, Cecil. Leo? Leo? Brother Leo, um, you once described the education system of black parents sending our children into British schools as the killing fields. Um, you just heard the eminent Cecil Gutsmore has explained how do we go about infiltrating, penetrating, because obviously you work outside of that curriculum. But the reality is no one's ever going to give you the education that you need to overthrow them. Brother Leo, the floor's yours. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the question, uh, Brother Jeff. And uh, suffice to say that when our brother uh, Cecil just spoke, he talked about the efforts inside of the educational system. And I've got a tremendous amount of respect for those brothers and sisters who have been working tirelessly for countless years trying to influence change within this system. But I would pose a question to you. It's a question that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan posed uh, several years ago. He asked the question, if a man won't treat you right, what makes you think that same man will teach you right? And what we have to really come to terms with, brothers and sisters, uh, and my young brother who was born in Sweden, in my view, is a classic example of what needs to be done and what must happen. Because if all of us examine the reality of our histories and what's happened to us, despite the fact that you have some black people who are successful, quote unquote, within this system it's got nothing to do with that system ever being designed or ever having any gene the, the, the nature of black people while we're able to survive within a system that was never ever designed yeah. for us and yeah. it will never be you know, you know my my dear brother we have to seriously think about an independent educational system as black people yeah which is, of course, it's not confined to education. It, it includes everything. This is politics, economics, uh, our social reality. Everything has to change because we are constantly trying to force our children who are square pegs into a round hole. And believe me, brother, they do not fit. And these people are so wicked in their behavior towards black people, that what they do is they keep shifting the goalposts, they keep changing, and they will write all manner of things in terms of changing legislation, et cetera, et cetera. But in reality, the situation never actually changes because you said it in your own question, Jeff, <laughs> they're never gonna educate us to overthrow their system or their rule. And in reality, black people and Caucasian people who are the dominant people who run the systems that we were enslaved in and continue to live within, they are diametrically opposed in their nature and their consciousness to we who are the original people of the earth. And we must separate and do something for ourselves if we're ever to realize our fullest potential. We can continue like this, uh, and we will have modicums of success here and there, but it will never be the true realization of who we are as a people and, and our true potential as a people. Leo, you said do for self. Sister Jennifer, Leo, I believe, is talking about empowerment, which is, you talked about the Community Empowerment Network. Um, it impacts on our children, it impacts on the way we think, we feel, our sexualization, genderization. Um, from your perspective, um, and what you do in terms of empowerment. Any suggestions for the panel as we go around? We, we'll get young people in as well. How do we go about empowering ourselves to take... Professor, Professor Gus John was a director of education. He took direct action. 
Cecil's taken direct action. Ishmael does when he when he speaks. From from, from your perspective, our communities, how can we empower? How can we lead? How can we engage those with power over us to allow us to enable ourselves? Thank you. Um, thank you, Jeff. One of the things that I neglected to say um, in my introduction is that actually Professor Gus is a founder of the Communities Empowerment Network, which was founded in 1999 and remains actively involved in, in, in the organisation um, and is a great support to myself. So I, 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 I would throw this open to him as well. But one thing that is my passion um, and has been for a very long time is empowering parents um, and sometimes you have got to you have to operate on on two levels you well maybe more than two you um, you handhold with parents um, you sometimes have to you're, you're walking in front and, and holding them holding their hands and sort of drawing them forward and sometimes you're behind them and you using those same hands to push them forward but I think there is something in, and, 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 and others will know this far better than myself, or maybe able to be more eloquent than myself in um, describing this, in that we have our children, and then there is this place called school, and then we give our, our children get to a certain age, and we give our children over to the school, almost as if the school is a separate entity from, our, from ourselves. Um, one of the one of you were describing earlier on, and I know that it's happened with many of you, about being uh, arrested for Sussan or about and uh, just our interaction with the police. But I'm minded, and I haven't had that many interactions myself. But when I have, or been party to one as I have been, I remind the police officer that they are a public servant, and I am a member of the public. Their job is to serve. Similarly. The school's, the school's job is to serve the, commu the community and we are the community and we have to, to take, we have to, it's, we need to try and change the way in which we see ourselves and I'm talking about the whole community but certainly parents. If I have my most precious, which is my child, and I give my child over to you to be educated, um, which in a sense, that, that whole transaction, there is something wrong with that, but let's, for the sake of argument, go with that then I give you I give you good, I expect better back. You know, if, if schools were, and I use this analogy a, a lot, if schools instead were Ford, and uh, as, as happened in 2013, I believe, I believe I'm right in, in saying this, but I might be wrong, 49% of all children, not just black children, failed to get a, 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 to, a to C in GCSEs. Um, now, if that were a car, a, a car production company, if the school was a car production company and 49% of all cars that came off that production line failed, we wouldn't look to the school, we wouldn't look to the, sorry, we wouldn't look to the, we wouldn't look to the car and say the cars have failed, we'd look to the, the, the entity, which is the school, and, and similarly, uh, which is the company, and similarly, I, I would say, we should look at, at our schools and not say why are our children failing, but why are the schools failing our children? And I think we empower parents to ask those questions and demand of the schools uh, and, and, and demand that the schools are accountable to us. We send our children to the school to be educated. We don't send them to school to be excluded yeah, I, I like, I, so i think we need to be much more demanding and we and, and in order to be able to demand we need to know how to make those demands well that that's uh, the point sister to... jennifer because but, yeah. sorry to cut you sister jennifer because i'd like to go to courtier that uh, uh jeff you directed that at courtier yeah, would you like to answer that question did you I was, ask, question? I, was, I was going to ask courtier in relation yeah. to what Jennifer has just said, Kulche, are you, your books and your exquisite and excellent writing, are you part of the national curriculum? No. If you are, let us know, because it's a travesty if you're not, no, and I'm what not. can be done to impel you within the system? I'm not, I'm not, and there's, there's, there, uh, following the Black Lives Matter movement and the unfortunate uh, murder of George Floyd, 
uh, and many others in, in, in America and over here, uh, people are trying to campaign to get my books in, on the curriculum. I've been approached by a, a number of people uh, who are saying, yeah, we need to make sure that this happens and stuff. There's actually a Teach First campaign as well, which was just launched about a month or so ago, which was saying that you know, these are one of the books I think should be in the curriculum, which was my first novel, The Scholar. But, but uh, yeah, I'm not really, unless I'm brought into the school by, uh, under the jurisdiction of the teacher themselves, you yeah. know, or, you know, they, they get in contact with me and say, come into the school, yeah, which really every time I'm asked, I'll go in and I'll, and, I'll, and I'll present to the kids and stuff and try to interact with them and show them that someone like myself, someone like themselves can be writers, can be a novelist, you know, uh, unless I'm brought in in that way, yeah, I'm, I'm non-existent, basically. You're, you're brought in as a role model for the day, standard, yeah. as well. Yeah. If you're on the curriculum, you're being taught countrywide. Right, exactly. uh, But the argument would also be that, once they, they, they've they had that daily contact with you, that one day contact, what happens with the rest of their school time? I'm, I'm conscious we've got a filmmaker on the panel. Uh, we've also George? got a conscious actor. Can over, over to you, Sister George Miller. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I thought that'd be an interesting uh, conversation because Courtier, just to let everybody know as well, you've just um, co-written Lovers Rock with Steve McQueen. Um, and I think there's another one that you have co-written. Red, 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 white and blue. Oh, red, white and blue. And, and the same for you, George. I mean, these are kind of tools that we can use for what you've, I mean, you've done the Mark uh, Duggan uh, documentary. Um, and as Jerry has mentioned, um, sorry, Jerry, I've forgotten the other name, alternative name, or your, your proper name. Um, these are tools that we use. Sorry, my apologies, my brother. <laughs> my apologies. Thanks. My apologies. Um, these are tools that, you know, we have mentioned um, that can help self-educate. But, um, and we, you know, I had a few when I was growing up with my father through Cecil um, and others. And I just want to ask between Coutier and, and, and George, how do you feel your material, how would you like your material to be used? Mm. I'll, um, I'll let George go first. Okay, uh, George? Uh, thanks, Coutier. Um, yeah, um, obviously I'd like um, uh, my films to be used as an educational resource that uh, speaks to young black people and um, can help them uh, with a sense of themselves and their identity and their, and their place in, in this society. Um, oh, Ishmael's back. I am um, back. You know, I remember uh, at school, I, um, I think um, for my A-level studies, we ended up, I ended up reading um, Linton Kwesi Johnson's England is a bitch. And I can only assume, because of the school I went to, that that must have been one individual teacher who wanted to, you know, who was a bit sort of uh, of a maverick or whatever you want to call, call it. But, um, you know, and then of course, meeting Linton uh, in person uh, recently to do this uh, Black Power documentary has been just amazing for me as a trajectory. And as I said to him, you know, that kind of my education about things that really directly affected me and my identity in school started with that book. I, I also, well, it didn't start with that. I, I read Malcolm X's autobiography by that time, but these were not things that were, Malcolm X's autobiography was not an official part of our school curriculum when it, it definitely should have been. Um, Again, uh, you know, in terms of being a filmmaker, I, you know, the impact of black filmmakers like Horace Ove and Menelik Shabazz and Colin Prescott uh, on me was immense because it was simply a case of thinking that, well, look, if those people can do it, then, then I can, I should ca carry on with this. You know, that, that was the direct encouragement. Um, but, um, you know, when I, uh, as a, when I said I wanted to go to art college, um, to my art chief at the time, he, his reaction was to say, well, black people don't go into the arts and have the education, you know, have uh, professional careers in the arts. You know, have you considered getting into whatever, you know, carpentry or something or bricklaying? <laughs> the typical. Yeah. Have you considered alternative? Yes. Of course, yeah. Would you like to give me uh, a brief on that? Um, 
yeah. Also to George on that before we go to Ishmael. I echo everything that George said, and before I get started, I just want to say that, you know, George, your film, The Hard Stop, is like, like, uh, it's so inspirational to me. Uh, you know, I don't believe that the education stops when we're young people. Uh, it carries on into adulthood and, and so on and so forth. And just, uh, that film was really inspiring for me. And it was one of the most you know, beautiful things I've ever seen. It is the, the most beautiful film I've ever seen about uh, black rich men. And uh, it was just really, it just, it gave me inspiration to carry on with what I was doing. Uh, things were very hard for me when that film came out. And just, uh, I was just like, okay, I've got to do this, man. This keeps me going. Also, Rise and Peace films, you know, your documentaries as well, kept me going in the same way. A lot of the stuff that you've made, Ishmael, was just really um, a catalyst for me to keep going, it was fuel for me to keep going. So I just wanted to say that before I even get into this. I mean, for myself, I've always wanted to be that kind of catalyst for people. I've always wanted to see my work, my work as a way of uh, empowering people and, uh, and giving them recognition that they exist and that, that, that they matter and that they, they you know, there's, there's, um, that they can see themselves, you know, um, within the pages of my books and stuff and that, that, that they are important and so, I took it upon myself, even when I first got into the industry, to do all the prisons, to do all the schools, everything I could, basically. If someone asked me, I would never say no, basically. And I would just like go in and do those things. And it was really difficult. It was a real struggle because I was seeing time and time again that I was the person who came in for the day and then I went out and my books weren't on the curriculum. I'd, I'd try and push for that kind of representation, not just of myself, but of other people as well. And it was a constant battle. And I'll tell you one, one thing, I mean, I'm not gonna go on for too long, but I'll tell you one thing, you one of the stories, but just to encapsulate that and, and really give evidence of that. I did uh, writing workshops at Shepherd's Bush Library for a number of years. I did them every Wednesday night. And uh, one time, one of the librarians said to me, come, I've got to show you something. And he took me downstairs into the basement of the, of the library. And there were like, I mean, it looked like at least between 500 to 1,000 black books in the library, just black books, okay? There was everything, wow. everything Never you seen could that. ever ask for. And it was in the basement of Shepherd's Bush Library. Yeah, I used to work in the libraries. Uh, they, they, they're not good with putting the books out unless it comes to black history. They, 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 they're, not, they're not on the floor. They're not on the shop floor. Yeah, they were exactly. all in the basement. And he said to me, this, this hippie, hippie white dude said to me, I don't understand what's going on. These books are down here and stuff, and I can't believe they bought these books years ago and stuff, and they've been down here for years and stuff. <laughs> and he basically said, you take what you want. You know what I mean? I'm 20 something years old. Thank you to all the guests who joined us tonight. Please join us for part two of the show, Education. Please like, share, subscribe. You can catch us on www.nextgeneration.com. See ya.